turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4 is where we will be. We read the text earlier. We'll begin to work our way through that in just a few minutes. 1 John chapter 4. We missed you guys last week. Uh, thankful for Stacy Dyer being able to uh, fill the pulpit in my absence last week. Hopefully you'll remember a couple of weeks ago. So two weeks ago, we looked at Luke 19, verses 11 to 27, where Jesus is on a trip from Jerusalem. He's moving from Jerusalem up to Jerusalem, or excuse me, from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And on the way, he tells the parable of the minas to those who are traveling with him. The folks following Jesus that day thought that when they got up to Jerusalem that Jesus would immediately lead a successful revolt against Rome, that he would take over the city of Jerusalem, reclaim it for Israel, and set up his messianic kingdom. The text tells us that's what they thought, and the text tells us that that's the reason Jesus told the parable of the minas. These people thought that all they had to do was just kind of tag along with Jesus be there, and they would be front and center and in the middle of the action. But Jesus tells the parable of the minas to make clear that his kingdom won't come immediately. Now, we know, because we know the rest of the gospel story, that the purpose of Jesus' first coming was to redeem all who will ever become citizens of his heavenly kingdom, children of God through faith in his finished work of salvation that was accomplished through his perfect life, his sin atoning death, and then on the third day, his victorious resurrection. And we know that that's exactly what happens in the rest of Luke's gospel. As Jesus gets to Jerusalem... Then, after he rose from the dead, Jesus, Scripture tells us, ascended to heaven, to the Father. And there he was crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. And today, he reigns from the Father's right hand. And he will reign until the time and the day that he returns. That he comes back to set up his eternal kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth, and reign there in the new Jerusalem among his own people. That's you and me if we know him today. And he will come back and do all of that. And so we know all of that, but again, they thought he was going to bring the kingdom in right then. And so in verse 12, he begins this uh, parable of the minas. He tells a story. He says, A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. And so the picture here is I'm going away, but before I, as the king, go away, Stay a while and then come back. But before I go, here's, here's some of my, my money. I want you to take my money. I'm going to give you uh, one of my minas, and I want you to engage in business with it until I come. All the noblemen's servants are entrusted with the same amount. They're each given a mina. It was equivalent to about 100 days or three, three months' worth of wages in that time. And all of his servants were told, engage in business until I come. Now, we saw last time, Jesus is the nobleman. We're the servants. Everybody tracking? Pretty simple to, to follow this story, right? This parable is pretty clear. If we claim to know him, we're his servants. He's the master, and he's given to us all equally a mana. The commission is to take the master's mana and invest it to make a profit to give to him when he comes back to set up his kingdom. We saw last time we've been commissioned to intentionally invest all that God has graciously given us for the glory of our Savior and for our coming King. What is this mana? What's this thing that every Christian has been given by God, by Jesus? 
Well, in its most basic form, it's the gospel, right? It's the good news that God gives grace, forgiveness, righteousness, redemption to all who will trust Him through Jesus' perfect obedience, His saving death, and His victory-giving resurrection. But it's, it's not just the gospel message, it's, it's the gospel put to work in our lives, right? The gospel lived out, if you will. It's you and me using our entire life, all that we are, all that we have, all that we can do, to advance the glory of Christ through gospel living and through gospel telling. Another way to think of what this mana that we've been entrusted with is as believers is this. It's living out the two great commandments, right? You remember those from Jesus? The two great commandments, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then there's a third great. The three greats of the New Testament can pretty much sum up the Christian life. Two great commandments. And then the third great is the great commission, right? Where we give our lives to making Jesus followers of all nations. Where we're following Jesus, we're followers of Jesus, right? And we spend our lives inviting others to join us in following Jesus and showing them, teaching them, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, how to follow him. Teaching them what Jesus says about living and how to live and, what, and, 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 and assisting them and together growing. Now, you'll remember that when the king came back, one servant had taken that mina and made ten minas profit for the king, a thousand percent interest. Another servant had multiplied his mina and had five minas, 500 percent return for the king. And those two servants received the king's affirmation of, well done. And they were rewarded hugely with greater kingdom responsibilities. The one who'd earned 10 minas got 10 cities. He, he went from three months' wages to ruling over 10 cities. The guy with five minas went from five, five, uh, you know, however many months' wages to five cities. But then there was that other guy, that other servant, who had taken the one mina his master had given him and wrapped it up in a napkin. And when his king came back, all he had to show was the one mina he had even carelessly, not even well hidden, not even carefully protected, but carelessly wrapped up and sat on a shelf. Because, as he says in verse 21 of Luke 19, for I was afraid of you, because you're a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. And you'll remember, that didn't go real good. The master wasn't real thrilled with that response, and he strips him of his one mina and gives the one mina to the, to the, to the ten mina servant and said, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And so, here's the question. What's behind the difference? You got ten mana guy, you got five mana guy. Well done, good and faithful servants. And you got napkin boy. What's the difference? You know, I've been thinking about, about this a lot lately. What's going on in, 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 in these two guys' hearts versus the one mana? I was afraid of you because you're a severe man servant. I've been thinking a lot about this for the last two weeks because I want to be faithful. And I want to be ready when Jesus comes back, don't you? I mean, he's coming. And I'm going to answer for what I've done with my mina, my life. You're going to answer for that. Here's the answer, I think. The unfaithful servant did not know the good heart 
of his master. In fact, he believed his master was unkind and severe. But the faithful servants, the ten mana guy, the five mana guy, they knew their master's heart and they were motivated to a life of faithful stewardship for his honor and his glory because they knew he was good. Do you know the good heart of your master? I'm convinced that that's the key to living faithfully and being ready for our king to come back. I want to take you to 1 John 4 this morning and show you how God says we can be confident at his coming. How many want to be confident at his coming? Hello? Some of you don't want to be confident. Okay. Everybody wants to be confident. I mean, when Jesus comes, you want to be ready or you're just, you're a fool. I mean, crazy. How is it that we can be confident at his coming? Here's the, the thing I, want, I just want to go ahead and tell you. You can be confident. You can be fearlessly confident at Jesus' return. How? Well, that's the question. That's the question and our text gives us two keys to being fearlessly confident at Jesus' return. Let's look at them. First of all, notice with me in verses 9 and 10 of 1 John 4, and also verses 13 to 16. We'll kind of work our way through that slowly. Notice with me, first of all, the first key to being fearlessly confident at Jesus' return is this. Fearless followers of Jesus clearly know the love of their Father for them. What makes a fearless follower of Christ fearless? Fearless followers of Jesus clearly know the love of their Father for them. Verse 9, in this, the love of God was manifest among us that, here it is, what's the this that showed us the love of God? God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. Man, if you know that, it changes everything. We didn't go looking for God. We didn't initiate a way for peace with heaven. Humanity didn't call a big mass meeting and say, hey guys, we got a problem, it's called sin, we need to phone home and get in contact with heaven and work out a deal because we're in real trouble down here. None of us did that. We were going 100 miles an hour in the other direction, loving sin. God loved us and sent his son to give eternal life to a world that was under the sentence of eternal death. For all of our sins. Jesus took our place and through his crucifixion propitiated the wrath of God toward our sins. My sin. Your sin. For he was the spotless lamb of God. The sinless lamb of God. Perfect. Given as a sacrifice in my place and in yours. Jesus fully satisfied the justice and wrath of God toward our sins through his death on the cross. That is mind-boggling love, is it not? You see, fearless followers of Jesus clearly know the love of their Father for them. I think of Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, and, and I don't know if anywhere else says it as beautifully as this, describing the sufferings of Jesus for us. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Father put on his own Son. All of my sin, all of your sin. And there he satisfied his own wrath against our sin by killing his son. This is the heart of the Father. 
This is what Jesus has done for us in obedience to the Father who loves us. For God so loved the world. In this way he loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to come live a perfect life in our place, to go to the cross and die the death we deserve, be buried dead three days and rise on the third day in victory, proving that he in fact paid it all, that it was finished, and that there is and can be forever more victory in Jesus. The text goes on in verse 13 and says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify. Now, for, for John, as he writes this, it was literal. He'd seen Jesus. And he was testifying eyewitness testimony to what he'd actually seen. He touched Jesus. He'd walked with Jesus for three years. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come, I love this, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Do you know and believe the love that God has for us? Do you believe what we've just said about Jesus and his sufferings in your place, his perfect life, his sin atoning death and his resurrection in your place? Do you know and believe the love that God has for us. Do you understand that the Father sent His only Son to do for you what you could never do for yourself? Live that perfect law-keeping life in your place. Die the death your sins deserved and thereby completely satisfy, listen to me, and forever remove from you the wrath of God. Do you really believe he did that for all who will ever believe on him? And then that he was raised from the dead in victory on the third day. Fearless followers of Jesus clearly know the love of their Father for them. That's what makes them fearless. When we clearly know the love the Father of the Father for us, our whole life changes and we give ourselves completely to living for the glory of the Savior. You see, I'm convinced that 10 minor guy and 5 minor guy knew the heart of their master and it made them fearless. It made them willing to invest his money. It made them willing to risk and take sacrifices for the good of their master's kingdom because he was a good king. And they really believed that if they made a profit when he returned, that they would be rewarded from the heart of their good king. So the first key to being confident at his coming is to know that fearless followers are clear, clearly know the loving heart of their Father. But secondly, notice this morning from 1 John 4, verses 11 and 12, and then 16 to 21, fearless followers of Jesus confidently show the love of their Father to others. So before we get into that, just catch this picture. On the one hand, fearless followers of Jesus clearly know the Father's love for them. They clearly know it. But on the other side, fearless followers of Jesus confidently show the love of God to other people. They know it personally, and they extend it practically. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. John said, here's the deal. This just, this just makes sense. If God loves us the way we've just spent 10 minutes talking about how he loved us in Jesus, y'all tracking? You want me to repeat that? No, you don't, but just roll that over in your mind. If God loves you like that, you know what John says? The only thing that makes sense is that we love one another. 
Like if we all have been loved by God this way, then how can we do anything else but love other people? Verse 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. You know what John's saying there? Nobody's ever seen God with their eyes, but the bottom line is they see him in our love. His love is perfected, made complete in us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, that is, in this this abiding in love, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Fearless followers of Jesus confidently show the love of their Father to others. God's love for us in Jesus, the text here says, this is interesting, is perfected in us. What does that mean? His love, verse 12 again, is perfected. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Verse 17, by this is love perfected with us. Well, the way this word perfected is used here is not the idea of being made flawless, but rather being made complete. And if you take this word and and do a word study throughout the New Testament, you find that that's the way it's used most consistently, actually. God's love for us in Jesus is perfected. God's love for us in Jesus is made complete in us. Listen, very important connection right here. When we love others as he loved us. Listen, the love that God has shown to us is made complete in us when we love others. The love God has shown to us in Christ reaches its appointed end, its goal, its design, only when we love as we have been loved. How important is loving people? What I just told you is, if we don't, we short-circuit the very love with which we've been loved. We stop God's love from having its full fruition, from having, getting all the way to its desired end and fruit in this world. But as God's love is perfected in us, made complete in us, when we love others as He's loved us, you know what the result of that is? Listen. The result of that is, the text tells us, verse 17, by this is is love perfected in us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. In other words, when we're loving others, and showing them the love the Father has for us in Jesus, we're living like Jesus. We're living like Jesus lived. And we're showing the world the Father's heart. Even as He is, so also are we in the world. And therefore, the fruit that comes from this kind of loving of people is that we have confidence and are ready for the day of judgment. We don't fear Jesus' return, but on the contrary, we are ready for him to come back. Listen, because we're living like he lived as we sacrificially love others with his love. Does that make sense? I mean, if I can know that I'm living like Jesus lived... If I can know that God's love to me is having its complete fruit in my life and I'm, and I'm serving, I'm, I'm giving, I'm, I'm, I'm helping people the way Jesus loved us, then when he comes, guess what? I know I'll, I'm doing what he told me to do. 
I'm a 10-mana guy. I'm a 5-mana guy. There's fruit in my life. Something's happening because of what God's given me in Christ. My life's been changed. Verse 18 goes on. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, what, let's talk about what this does not mean and what it means. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, this does not mean that we love perfectly. Amen? We're clear on that. We know that. You could go to other places in 1 John. John, John, John tells us in another place in, in, in the book, a couple places. Basically, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. The truth's not in you. Pretty plain. <laughs> even today, even as his children, if you say you live your life and you're perfect, you're a liar. You don't know God. Discussion over. So, so this does not mean that we love perfectly perfectly. This does not mean that our love is perfect like God's love or that our love atones for anyone's sins. That somehow as we love people, we save people. No. But it does mean that God's love is completed in our lives when His love flows through us and is extended in sacrificial service into the lives of God. Of others, and when we find ourselves loving like this in the power of His Spirit, fear of Jesus' return, fear of judgment is cast out because we're proving we're sons and daughters of God by our love. John Piper says it this way Perfected love is the love of God expressing itself in our love to each other. Perfected love is love that does not die on the vine. It's love that comes to fruition in love for others. The way to boldness, listen to this, the way to boldness, the way to confidence and fearlessness is to walk love, not just talk love. Now that's, worth, that, that's a popper quote that bears repeating. The way to boldness? How many, of you, how many of you wished you were bolder with the gospel? How many wished you were more confident about Jesus' return? Then write this down. The way to confidence, the way to boldness and fearlessness is to walk love, not just talk love. That's what John is telling us in 1 John 4. How big a deal is loving other people? Well, it just depends on how confident you want to be at Jesus' return. Depends on how bold you want to be for Jesus in this world. If you're not really concerned about all that, then just live for you. You want to be ready for him to come back? Then love people. Let the love God's shown to you flow through you into the lives of other people. Perfected love. God's love made complete in our lives. I was talking to one of you this week. Is courageous and intentional, and practical love. It's the kind of love that doesn't just talk about telling others about Jesus. You actually talk about Jesus to that friend, that loved one that needs Him. It's the kind of love that, that doesn't just acknowledge that there's hungry people in Gilmer County, but you actually do something to feed those people, whether that's giving or volunteering at the Gilmer Food Pantry. It's the kind of love that doesn't just talk about making disciples, doesn't just say that you believe the Great Commission and that it's for you, but actually teaches a new believer how to follow Jesus. 
because you actually take the time to establish a loving and accountable relationship with that person. We actually spend time with other believers around the Word of God and in prayer, and, and we help each other love God more by obeying His good and loving commands. It's courageous, it's intentional, it's practical love. By the way, that last part is what we call discipleship. Helping each, other follow, helping each other follow Jesus. Helping each other, teaching others, you know. Bottom line is, you, you, know, how, you know how far ahead of somebody you need to be to, to, to disciple them? About a half a step. Just about a half a step. Because guess what? We're all continuing to grow. And, and, and this is what I've, I find in, in, in I'm, I'm, I've got a... Uh, little group going. We've got three guys we meet every couple of weeks and around God's Word and encourage each other, pray for each other, share from Scripture together. About an hour every, every couple of weeks we do that. But you know what's so crazy? I, there's, there's mornings, I guarantee you. They leave and they say, boy, I hope Chad got something out of that because I didn't. But I did. <laughs> Truth is, we, we sharpen each other. See what I'm saying? We, we share life, we're, we encourage, and, and, I, and I hear them talk about what God's doing in their life, and I'm encouraged and I'm challenged at points. And, 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 and around the group, we, we, we see this going on. By the way, that model, that dynamic, let me just tell you something. It's, it's, it is the church. I'm not, this is not the sermon for that. We'll get there probably in the next couple of weeks. Just understand that little small group deal I just described, like it shouldn't be optional in your life. If you don't have that, you need that. If you're not discipling someone and you're a disciple, how does that work? Jesus said, go make disciples. What did you not understand? What's unclear? Amen, oh me. And by the way, this whole thing about helping others learn, helping each other obey... God, I said, I said it very specifically here. Helping each other obey his good and loving commands. I wanted to preach a longer passage this morning, but you sure are glad I'm not. 1 John 5, just the next chapter. chapter if you got your Bible open, flip over there. 1 John 5, verses 3 and 4 says this. His commands are not burdensome. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. His commands are just the best way to live life. The way you're designed to live life. It's getting the owner's manual out and saying, this is the way the human life functions best. Let's learn how to do this together. Let's, let's learn how to drive this car the right way. That's what it's all about. 1 John 3, 16 to 19. This is not the only time in this book that John says these kinds of things. In verse 16 of 1 John 3, it says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And the implication is, the answer to that rhetorical question is, it don't. Verse 18, little children, listen to this. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth kind of love that we're talking about. This perfected in us love is courageous, intentional, practical love. Verse 19 says, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. By what? By verse 18, that we love not in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Notice, by this, verse 19, we shall know that we are of the truth. We'll know that we're saved. Hello? Hello? And we will reassure our heart before Him. Are y'all tracking? The more you love, the more assurance of your salvation and your oneness with Christ you have. Fearless followers of Jesus confidently show the love of their Father to others. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Whoever lives in fear of judgment day, if that's you this morning, I'm talking to you now. Whoever lives in fear of judgment day proves that he or she does not have the love of God in Christ made complete in them. And like that unfaithful wicked servant, the fearful live selfish lives that don't show others the Father's love. 
Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Hear me, never forget that order. It's all important. We love both God and others because He first loved us. It all starts with His love for us in Christ. It's His love for us that enables us to love others as we've been loved. Everybody clear on that? We love because He first loved us. Fearless followers of Jesus confidently show the love of their Father to others. Verses 20 and 21, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Do I need to explain how serious it is your relationship with with your brothers and sisters in Christ in this local church. That's heavy. You can say you love God all day, but if, you, if there is somebody in this church family that you don't love, that you won't love, that you won't listen to me, there's something between you and you won't make it right, let me just tell you something. The Bible says, God says, you're a liar. You're a liar. Because you cannot love God whom you've never seen if you won't love the one you can look into their eyeballs. I mean, is that fair? That's what it says, isn't it? Failure, failure to live a life of love for others proves that we've not known God's love and that we do not love God. Piper has some good insight when he says this, one of the main reasons, listen to this, this is important for everybody in the room, one of the main reasons why so many professing Christians have little confidence with God and little boldness with men is that their lives are not devoted in love to the salvation of the lost and to the glory of God, but instead are devoted, often by sheer default, to providing earthly security and comfort for themselves and their families. When we try to say that we are indwelt by the Spirit of Christ, and yet we do not devote our lives to the eternal good of other people, there is a deep contradiction within that gnaws away at our souls and dissolves our confidence and leaves us feeling weak and inauthentic as we are. Could that be the reason for your lack of confidence in and boldness for Jesus. There's two keys to being confident it is coming. Fearless followers of Jesus clearly know the love of their Father for them. And they confidently show the love of their Father to others. You've got to have both to be confident it is coming. You've got to know the Father's heart, but you've got to show the Father's love to others. You, you have to allow God's love to you in Christ to perfect itself, to, to mature, to come to completion in your love for others. Those are the two keys for being confident at His coming. You know, today if you lack confidence before God, if you would say, I'm not ready for Jesus to come back, if you find yourself fearfully trying to just take care of you and yours, not making sacrifices of time and energy and resources to love other people, then, then the call for you today is to look to the cross of Jesus where the loving heart of your Father for you is so beautifully revealed. And as you see the Father's love for you, that love let me tell you what will happen when you really embrace his love for you and Jesus. That love will fill and overflow your heart into the life, into a life of love for other people. 
and you'll experience a confidence before God, perhaps like you've never experienced because He is enabling you in that moment, in that that lifestyle, to live like Jesus so that you're ready for Him to come back and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Will you be confident at his coming? Let's pray.